what an honor to be on Tar Heel territory. Oh my goodness, it's incredible. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, I really love what I speak about. So as Jay so kindly introduced me, um, I speak about mental health, mental illness, and stigma. Um, it's something I'm really, really passionate about. And I, and I really hope, um, if you guys are okay with it, I want to share my personal experience with it today. But I want to start out by letting you guys know why talking about mental health and mental illness matters. So the first thing I'm going to get you guys to do is look around the room really quickly. We're in a beautiful hall. I'm just going to get you guys to turn your necks a little bit. I know it's been a long day. So I want you guys to look around, take a good look. And I want to let you know that in this country, so in the United States, every single year we will lose the amount of people in this room times three in the amount of youth who die by suicide. And that is shocking, that is devastating, and that is something that needs to change. And although mental illness is a very complex thing, one thing we know for sure through research and professionals is that talking about it, bringing it out of the shadows and into the light, is what's going to help people to access better treatment, to feel more supported, to feel less isolated, and to live a life that's meaningful and happy. My connection to mental illness starts as in a similar way to many. In this country and as well in Canada, where I'm from, one in four people are affected by mental illness. Now this number is considered to be a low estimate because of the stigma I just spoke about. A lot of people don't get treatment, so we're not able to count them into the statistics. But one in four is a huge number. If you think of in your own house, in a family of four, that's one person in that house who will deal with a mental illness throughout their lifetime. And I happen to be one of those people. When I was 12 years old, I developed a very, very severe form of something called obsessive compulsive disorder, which is an anxiety disorder made up of two components. Obsessions are the invisible things. These are the thoughts, the fears, the phobias that plague somebody with OCD. The compulsions are what keep us very, very busy. These are the actions that people with OCD perform, often for hours at a time, to rid themselves of the anxiety that this disease causes. In 2004, the World Health Organization published a list of the top 10 most debilitating conditions, and OCD ranked sixth. This speaks to the nature of how debilitating this illness can be. And often, I think people don't realize because it's glamorized or it's made fun of in the media and mainstream TV and movies. For me, when my OCD hit, my family and I were shocked. I was a happy and healthy 12-year-old. I'd always been an anxious kid, but I was functioning well, and I really just loved life and loved being 12. It's pretty fun. But all of a sudden, I was struck by this disease. The first memory I have of dealing with my OCD was after I'd been sick with a fever for a few days, I'd wanted to brush my teeth. Dental hygiene is very important. And I got out of bed to brush my teeth. And I remember being unable to stop brushing one of my back molars for about an hour and a half. And I was terrified. I didn't know what was going on, but I had this feeling that it wasn't right. I couldn't stop. It wasn't clean enough. I hadn't done it enough times. And I continued over and over and over again. And this was just a preview for myself and my family of what the next few years would be like as the OCD slowly seeped into all aspects of my life. Now, at the time, I was in grade 7, and after that Christmas break when I had gotten sick and the symptoms of my OCD first started, I went back to school because we weren't really sure what we were dealing with. But very quickly, we saw how it was impacting me on a daily basis. One of the first things that started happening back at school was, in my school, in the corridors, the hallways had tiles. And there were cracks in the tiles. And my OCD told me that if I stepped on a crack in the tile, I had to walk to my locker and start my journey to class again. So I would miss hours of class at a time because I would almost make it to class, step on a crack, and feel the need to start that journey again. So as you can see, things were getting a little tricky. Getting lots of steps on a pedometer but wasn't making it to class. That is a problem. So, you know, my parents, who were really incredible, said, you know what, why don't we come in and talk to your classmates and let them know that, you know, what you're dealing with is something that you haven't chosen and you're not just trying to get attention because sometimes people just don't understand it, right? So they said, why don't we come in, we're going to talk to your class, we're going to try and explain to them what this disease is all about. And that was sort of one of my first exposures to the idea of being open about this. You know, I was so lucky that my parents didn't tell me to hide it, didn't tell me that it was something to be ashamed of. So my parents went into my class and they let them know what was going on. They explained what OCD was and something incredible happened. The next day, two boys in my class came up to me and said, you know, Elise, we heard what your parents said, and we heard about the tiles, and we're going to take turns piggybacking you to class so that your feet don't have to touch the ground. That is my favorite sound in the world. I'm so lucky. I get to travel to a lot of places, and every time I wait for that. So thank you. I love hearing that. And I tell, especially high school students, I say to them, girls and boys, I say, the most important lesson I'm going to teach you, hopefully not the most, but maybe one of the top ones, never settle for anything less than a boyfriend or girlfriend who will piggyback you because it is very hard to find later in life, I'm telling you. So I should have stuck with those boys. 
And you know, but apart from the piggyback rides, that was such an important lesson for me because it taught me the importance of being open. That sharing my story allowed the people around me to react in a way that was supportive and helpful and creative. And the only way that can happen is if we feel that we can speak about it. And if I hadn't been able to and I had felt ashamed and isolated, I would have been unable to ask for that help. And I would have been unable to stay in school for as long as I did before my first hospitalization, and I'm sure of that. Another incredible statistic I came across a few years ago was by the National Alliance for Mental Illness. They looked at the, a huge study of number of people who drop out of college, and they found that almost 70% of people who drop out of college do so because of a mental illness. Now, out of that 70%, 50% of those college students said that they felt too ashamed, embarrassed, or scared to ask for help before they had to drop out. That's terrifying to me. But the thing that I realize is that we can work so that that doesn't happen. We can start creating these conversations so that people don't get to that breaking point and so they can ask for help before this happens. I know we can. And often I get these questions from the amazing youth that I speak to or from police officers, nurses, and they say to me, you know, we're scared. We don't know how to start these conversations. We don't want to make things worse. We don't want to offend someone by asking. And I say to them, okay, let me ask you a question. What would you do if you saw someone with a broken leg, how would you support them? And they say, well, first I would probably say, you know, how are you feeling? And I say, okay, that's good, that's a good start. And they say, you know, I'd probably say, what can I do? Can I, can I hold the door for you? Can I carry some stuff for you? And I say, wow, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. And they say, yeah, okay, but that's for a broken leg. And I say, okay, but here's the amazing thing. A mental illness in a lot of ways is no different. It's a part of our body that's not functioning, right? Our brain is having a hard time. I often say my brain was having a blonde moment. Our brain is having a hard time, right? And we are impacted. Our daily activities, our daily activities of living are impacted, similarly to a broken leg. But for some reason, when someone has a broken leg, we react with support and empathy, and we're not afraid. And that's my dream. I really hope that someday we can start to see mental illness in the same way that we see things like broken legs or diabetes without fear or shame. And that people feel like they can reach out to the people around them and say, hey, instead of would you mind holding the door for me, would you mind sitting with me? Because I'm really not having a good day and I don't feel that it's safe for me to be alone. Or hey, would you mind coming with me? I'm going to go to the campus clinic and see a counselor, but I don't, feel, I don't feel ready to take those steps by myself. That's my dream. And I really believe we can start these conversations. You know, a few years ago, I was really fortunate and I spoke to an audience of about 500 high school students, and it was a high school that was there, and at the end of my talk, I usually try and do a big question and answer period. And I had one boy stand up, he was in the way back of the auditorium, and he said, you know, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. And I said, absolutely. And he stood up and he said, you know, this is my high school, these are my peers, and I wanna take this time today to let them know that I've been dealing with depression since grade nine, and I've always been too scared to tell any of my friends. And that moment for me, was life-changing. It was very early on for me in my speaking career. And it was at that moment that I realized, when we start having these conversations, the snowball effect starts to happen. People around us start to say, you know, me too, I struggle with this, or my mom struggles with this, or my sister's been in the hospital for the past two weeks for a depression episode. These are the things that start to happen. We start to realize that one in four is actually four out of four, because we're all impacted by mental illness, whether we have a mental illness or not. And that's something that I really want you to remember. Because even when you feel like it's something that's too strange or difficult to talk about, I promise you that almost every person around you has had an experience with it in one way or another. And I'm hoping I can prove that to you. Now, most any researchers here would know that what I did was just set you up for a biased response. But I would like to ask <laughs> how many people in the audience know somebody in their close circle, family or friends, who has dealt with a mental illness? Keep your hand up. And I want everyone to look around. So nobody, thank you guys, your arms are lovely, but you can put them down. Nobody has to feel like they're in this alone. Everybody here, in one way or another, has had an experience with a mental illness. And this is why this conversation needs to be started, because we all get it on some level. But yet there's a disconnect, because people are feeling like we don't get it, that we don't understand, and then they feel isolated and are, and are unable to ask it, access treatment. It's funny because my mom, from the time I got sick, told me that everybody has a challenge in life. Whether it's somebody who has a really bad allergy and their whole life has to carry an EpiPen, or somebody who's born with a physical deformity and struggles with that. Mine just happened to be a mental illness. And it's funny because that point was never better illustrated for me than a few years ago, two years ago now, when I guest lectured in the Faculty of Education at my university. And I spoke to teachers' college students, and it was, it was great. I loved it. I had so much fun. They were amazing. And after that, I got an email from one of the students in the class, and he asked for my number. And that never happens, by the way, like never happens. Um, I'm being honest. And so I was kind of shocked at first. First I was like, mom, did you pay this guy to do this? Like, I'm really confused. 
So I emailed him back and I thought that was lovely and we went out on a date and you know, the first thing I said to him, I said, listen, I said, you know, I'm really flattered, but I literally spent three hours telling you about sort of all the strange behaviors I do and how I have a really hard time showering and brushing my teeth some days. Why the heck did you ask me out on a date? And he said, you know, everybody has problems, but at least you're getting help for them. I was like, that is a really, wow, thank you. He said, yeah. He's like, you know, I feel like if, you know, things went further with us, and I was like, whoa, a little fast. Um, you know, he's like, at least somebody is doing paid therapy for you, and I wouldn't have to worry about that. I was like, you are a smart man. But that really illustrated for me, right? That illustrated that we know that everybody has challenges. That's something we know, every human, that that's the nature of being human. Just like it's in our nature to want to invent, it's also in our nature to have struggles. And this is something we have to keep in mind, because when we realize this, that's when we'll realize that mental illness is not a strange thing. It's just one of those struggles that we all share. And not everyone experiences mental illness as their struggle, but everybody experiences a struggle. I find it incredible because some of the glimmers of light that I've seen throughout my, my talks ha has been little things, you know, the, the emails that I'll get from students saying, how can I get involved? How can I share my story publicly? Or, you know, the high school boys who often after a talk I give will say, can we piggyback you to your car? And I say, that's very kind, but I'm actually doing better with that, but maybe just for fun. Um, <laughs> just joking, I don't actually do that. These are the glimmers of light I see where light is shining through this cloud that has surrounded the idea of mental illness. I like to do this exercise, especially when I'm with younger high school students, where I ask them for things in the past that they think our society has been too scared to talk about. Some of the things that come up are things around gay rights, homosexuality, but also, also things like breast cancer. For a long time, that was a disease that wasn't discussed. It was considered to be very private and almost embarrassing to talk about in public. And I find that amazing because in a lot of ways, we're still at that point with mental illness. People are scared, ashamed, embarrassed. I often hear people say to me, you know, I've only told my parents, I've only told one friend because I'm so scared that people are going to treat me differently. And I often say two things to them. The first thing I say is, you know, in a way, it would be nice if they treated you differently because what I hope is that difference would be support and empathy because that's something we all have the ability to do as human beings is to empathize. So even if they can't relate to your mental illness, they can relate to struggle because they have them too. So I hope that they can be empathetic and I promise you that a vast majority of people will be. The second thing I say to people who say that they're scared about how people will react is I say, you know, you never know by opening that door what you might allow for that person to do as for themselves. Sometimes it just takes that one person to open up and say, be vulnerable and say, this is what I'm struggling with. For a bunch of other, you know, grade 12 kids in a room of 500 to stand up as well and say, I suffer with that too. So we need to remember that we have that power to start these conversations. And it's these conversations that are going to lead to happier and healthier campuses, communities, and families. Thank you guys so, so much.